name is Miss Chow. I teach biology in San Jose, California. This is the second video to our ecology lecture. Today we'll be going over population ecology, the theories, how are the different ways we are analyzing a population, what are the limits, and predicting the future. Why are we looking at population and taking time to survey organisms? One is to better understand how they are living so that we can better help conserve and protect them since us humans have been the ones who've been destroying their habitats and putting them endangered. So for today's lecture, we're going to be using the southern sea otter, which is also called the Inhydra lutris. As our example, here we have a sea otter with its pup, and then we have a sea otter who is on its belly feeding. So population is a group of one type of organisms living in the same area. Now we have a very nice sea otter grooming itself. If it's not grooming, they are spending 12 hours a day eating. Who's causing all of Earth's problems? All we have to do is pull up a mirror and look at ourselves. We are nearing overpopulation and in the time being, as we are living, we're also causing huge environmental problems. Overpopulation has been talked about since 1787 with Mathis here. And this is a picture of Mathis on the right-hand side. So the Neo-Mathis are people who believe in him. And he predicted that by the 19th century that humans would exceed their food supply so that we also have our own population limits. And that would be food and space to consider that. However, Mathis did not consider technological advances that we have to help increase our food supply and living conditions and our, and our technology and medicine, which has allowed us to keep growing and exploiting the environment. So the idea of Mathis is that there is a growth limit in which we call in population ecology limiting capacity. And things that are usually limiting are food and resources, as I've mentioned before. Kind of the opposite idea of that would be the cornucopians. This is first started by a man named Julian Simon. They think that there's no limit because people will find a solution so far. And to help you remember what cornucopia means, this is a visual where you have this basket with plenty full of food. So cornucopian means there's always plenty, there's no worries. Human population, we've always, we're almost gonna go over. So where has history been trying to protect our society? The ancient Greeks used to put a minimum age for marriage at 30. And in 1979, China implemented one child policy or fines for economic compensation fees. That means if you have more than one child, you would have to pay the government more money. And to this day, that is still the common practice in China. Is it something that we make our choice for ourselves or is that the government going to be? Human populations have a huge larger effect on other organisms in which we live with. For example, the southern sea otter here. This is a lovely picture of a raft, which is a bunch of sea otters floating together. And this was taken in 1938 in Big Sur. In the 1700s, there were over 16,000 sea otters that forged off the California coast. Humans found out that the sea otters were hunted for their thick and soft fur. They're so thick and useful for insulation that in one square inch, there's over a million hairs. And if you were to touch it, it feels super soft. So we were exploiting it, not thinking about the population and just doing it not only for the money, but for the use. Until 1911 was the first law to try to protect the sea otters was the International First Seal Protection. You know, back then there wasn't much regulation and people were still hunting it. By 1930, we almost hunted the sea otters to extinction. They found a population of 50 sea otters in Big Sur. From those 50 sea otters, populated to the sea otters that we have today. You can see that these sea otters can grow up to five to six feet and these are their pelts. So the final front of sea otter population, the only data that we do know in 1741 was there were about 16,000 sea otters that they estimated. There was a huge long period where there was no data at all. 
1930, they found 50 because they thought they killed them to extinction. And then in 1977, southern sea otters were put on the Endangered Species Act. From then on, there has been more studies and scientists keeping track of the sea otter populations. In 2015, they were measured to be 3,054. However, sea otter population's been going up and down and hasn't been going much up. Currently in 2019, the three-year average is 2,962 southern sea otters. Some ways in which when we look at an organism, how can we analyze uh, and what things can we get out from their population data? First, we can look at density. Second, distribution, intrinsic growth rate, sex ratio, and age structure. So the first thing we're going to talk about is density. Density is how close do an organism live close to each other in a certain area. So let's go ahead and get the pointer going. This is a California Sea Otter uh, census results from spring of 2019. They're going to use colors to define density between zero to about three, 500 meters per coast. It's going to be yellow. As it gets to light orange colors, the popular range is from probably three to seven sea otters per 500 meters of coast. And then as it gets to red, it's 10 or more. And if you look at the California coast, this is looking at central California because it's in the middle of California. We're going to start with Highway 101, which runs along the coastline. We're going to start with Gaviota Beach, which is right above uh, Santa Barbara. And as you go here, there are little spots of light orange. So maybe three to five sea otters per 500 meters of coast. So kind of sparse. There may or may be a few up here. Then you have larger amounts in Pismo Beach, where you see it's between five and 10 sea otters per 500 meters of coast. Maybe a few inside Morro Bay. And we're still on Highway 1. And as we go up to up towards San Martin, this is where 101 turns into Highway 1 because 101 keeps going on inner land. This is, turns into Highway 1. And you can tell there are between 5 and 10. We're going to pass Big Sur. There's Carmel and Monterey where there's a higher intensity of uh, 10 or above. And this is where the Monterey Bay Aquarium, which does conservation efforts mainly on the sea otter. Then over here, you can see more prominent orange. This is Elkhorn Slough. And go around the coast of Capitola. This would be Santa Cruz here. Daniel Nuevo Point and Pigeon Point, which is before Half Moon Bay. This is where sea otters are mostly concentrated. So next, we're going to talk about distribution. How are organisms spaced out in relation to each other? There are three kinds, as you can tell in this graphic from CK12. Patterns of population distribution, clumped, random, and uniform. Ones for our clumps, usually it's when organisms are living together, they have relationships with each other, and they tend to live in areas where there is the food and the space or the resources. And they're usually clumped together because they have a relationship. Most organisms live in those kind of distribution patterns. Sometimes some organisms do not have relationships with each other. So when they don't have relations with each other, there's no reason to live together. So um, random is usually the case when the individuals within populations do not interact strongly with each other. And then we have uniform here. Now uniform is where you have resource that is very scarce. And because it's really scarce for competition, the organisms live apart from each other equally. So an example of that would be the Trilla cact cacti is always fighting for water with other cactuses. So they're usually uniform to get the same amount of water. And you kind of wonder about that. Next time you go see a desert, look at the picture, look how far apart the cactuses are uh, up apart from each other. The third type of population, look at the sex ratio and age structure. Sex ratio means looking at how many females are there biologically, how many males. Age structure is how many of each organism, depending how old they are, because sometimes their age uh, may determine certain properties about them. So here we have data from California in 2017 of all the males 
and then all the females and the age ranges. And this tells you in terms of how many millions of people. Intrinsic growth means in a given year, how many sea otters did you start off with? How many did you end up with? Birth, when they reproduce, you're going to get more sea otters. And sea otter babies are called pups. If there's birth, the opposite of that would be deaths. So if the sea otter were to die. Immigration means if there's sea otters coming in. And if sea otters are moving out, it kills immigration. Usually southern sea otters, they don't really migrate too much. They kind of stay in the same area. If they do happen, they'll probably go from one population to another nearby. We're going to have in zero as in how many sea otters did you start off with, B as in birth, D as in death, I for immigration, and E for immigration. For a general formula, the, the change in the numbers will be the number of births minus deaths plus the number of immigrated minus the immigrated that have left. That will give us the net population. Here we have a population of eight sea otters. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight sea otters. We're going to have four births and then three of them died off. Three of them immigrated coming in. There were three of them. And one of them decided to leave and immigrated. So let's go ahead and put these numbers in a formula where the change in the population is the number of births, which is four, minus the number of deaths, which is three, plus the number of immigrated, which is three, minus the number of immigrated, which is one. Change is going to be the difference is one plus two, and that equals three of growth. Growth rate is you take the change, which is three more sea otters than before, divided by the original amount that we had, which is eight. Take that and you multiply it by 100, that'll give you 37.5%. Let's review what we talked about so far, population analysis. Different ways how we can analyze the population is by density, how many in a certain area. Distribution is what patterns are they in, clumped, random, or uniform. We look at the sex ratio, number of males and females, how old they are, which is consideration. And the last one we just went over is intrinsic growth. That means how much has the population changed in terms of growth or loss. And that considers births, number of births coming in, deaths going out, number of immigrants coming in, and number of immigrations going out. Last things we're going to cover is looking more specifically at density. What is density dependent and what is density independent? In density dependent are population limits. What are some factors that limit a population? Let's look at this graph here. This is expected versus the actual growth of sea otter population at San Nicolas Island. If you look at San Nicolas Island, they started off when they started taking annual program data here. They start off with 25. The highest annual count in San Nicolas Island is going to be represented by the red line. Ideally, when a population is stabilized for the sea otters, it's going to be over here at 125. And this is where it's established. And the carrying capacity of that area is going to probably be around 330. And this is determined on how much food resources there are in that given area of around San Nicolas Island that could support that many sea otters. So right now, our sea otter population have not even hit their um, highest capacity yet, their limited capacity based on food in area. So we have to look at food and space resources for density dependent. And that creates an idea of your population limit, which is also called carrying capacity. And usually they're represented by the letter K. Density independent means it changes in population independently. These are things that do not affect the resources or anything like that. These are natural disasters, temperatures, flooding, landslides, and tsunami. In general, we do affect the climate change, which can be a density independent factor in terms of like the rise in sea temperatures and the lower pH. We may have a factor in that, water pollution, base, and chemicals like DDT. 
lot of times when we think of uh, pollution, we think of trash. This is an unfortunate picture of a, a sea otter pup getting stuck in a plastic bag. Fortunately, the sea otter mother was able to get the pup out of the bag and it was able to survive and not suffocate. The sea otters are dying from diseases from bacterial infections and parasites, specifically toxoplasmosis. They do die from boat strikes that meant as well. If you are in the presence of sea otters, you are by law to keep away from them for at least 100 yards. Toxoplasmosis, if your cat is infected and the waste goes into cat litter, do not flush the cat litter into the water system because eventually it goes out to the ocean after it's processed and the parasite is still alive in the water. So the best way to get rid of cat waste is to make sure it goes into the trash. And the skeletal muscles of the sea otter, they are smaller species and the sea otter eventually will not be able to function and think properly that they eventually die from toxoplasmosis. And this is why it's very important that we do not flush um, cat litter down the drain. There are some models that will help us predict the future for conservation efforts. One is called minimal viable population. What's the minimal number of an organism that can survive even under normal random catastrophes without going extinct. These can be temperatures that flare up, maybe cold periods, hot periods, uh, excessive rain, reproduction, looking at their birth age, their age structure, and how diverse are their genetics in order to survive. The second is looking at population viability analysis. How can we humans try to use the data of an organism's interactions with its ecology, with the other organisms to protect them from extinction and help save them. About a month ago, in Africa, officials say a total of 330 elephants are now known to have died for ingesting cyanobacteria. Poaching has been ruled out um, as a cause of death. So my question to you all, is this a natural catastrophe that's happening or is this something that are affected by humans? So let me explain, in this picture, we have a water hole. Then we have two elephants lying dead over here. So what happened is they found out, usually the pot, the numbers, is if there's any cyanobacteria in the water naturally occurring, it is not usually high enough that causes disease. What happened was the temperature was unnaturally high, so high that increased the amount of cyanobacteria in watering holes in Africa that when the elephants drink out of that, they die. Because each population is unique. Two kinds of sea otters. A sea otters, uh, in northern sea otters, we call off of Adak Island in Alaska. They have, how are populations surviving in the outside of the coast? And then they have a clam lagoon. How are they surviving? Um, in the salt marsh habitat, and this is from a... 60 year period from 1940 to 2020. Whereas here you have a salt marsh habitat, and this is central California, you have the outer coast populations going up and down, but then you have a whole bunch of sea otters living in the Elkhorn Slough, and they've been steadily rising up much faster than the clam lagoon from 1980 to 2015. We can look at populations, see what is going well in one area, why is it so much better in the Elkhorn Slough area than it is in a clam lagoon. And what is happening in Alaska that has plenty of it so much versus here in Central California is not so much. And the last thing we're going to talk about is life expectancy of an organism. Sometimes can be predicted with survivorship curves, looking at their population data. How many people have, how many organisms have died and at what age? So how does your age indicate your ability to survive for an organism? Type 1 tends to happen when you have low death rates and many old individuals go live until old age. Um, they have low infant death rate and high levels of parental care. These tend to happen with larger mammals, including us humans. Second type is when death rate is constant throughout the ages. So that's why it is a straight line. And this occurs when some species of birds and a lot of asexual species, species that can reproduce 
without having another partner. Type three is usually when there's a lot of deaths to the offspring. So you have a lot of offspring because a lot of them are eventually going to die uh, being food for others or dire conditions. This usually happens with plants where you have tons of seeds. A couple of them will eventually grow and be on their own or fish. They usually have this pattern. Okay, so just remember that population ecology is uh, scientists go out into the field collecting data on organisms so we learn more about them and how we can better protect them for conservation efforts. Thanks. Talk to you later.